Welcome to Talk Empowerment Hour. I'm your host, T. Caseman, and I look forward to talking to you and not at you. This show provides empowerment, perspective, and context to unique societal issues and daily events in your life. I look forward to your conversation. You can call into the studio at 813-235-0644. And this is Talk Empowerment Hour, broadcasting live here from Tallahassee, Florida. It's a bright, sunny day. Well, nighttime for most of us. And I look forward to a stimulating conversation. And welcome to my first voyage where we're going to discuss a lot of dynamic issues today that affect social, social and family issues. And the, the idea of this show is to give you resources that you can use in your daily life to help you manage any kind of adversities that you go through. So anytime you call in, if we have a resource that you may need and help your family through any kind of problematic issues that you face in a daily life, we're willing to help. And we're always here. You can email us at empowermenthour at yahoo.com. Or again, you can call in at 813-235-0644. I look forward to my friends taking this voyage with me, this maiden voyage. For those that are listening outside, family members and friends and professionals, I look forward to this conversation that we might have. Uh, today, T. Caseman is going to take you through the format because this is a new voyage, so we're going to experiment together. Uh, I like to personally start off with a quote of today. And after I do the quote, uh, we'll talk about the elephant in the room. And most people don't really realize what an elephant in the room, and you have to visualize it and just picture a, a heavy burden or latent problem that you might be experiencing, and uh, you might hesitate to talk about it, but we need you to talk about it because once you talk about an issue, then you can go to the stage of healing. And that's where we want you to be. And this show is to match you up at resources, matching re needs to resources. And that is the ideal perspective of social work one on one. And I'm T. Caseman. Um, we will also follow up with a social scenario. Maybe many of you might be able to relate to this social scenario, but I want to enlighten you about issues that maybe you're not thinking about or maybe you're not encountering in your daily life that you may need to focus on because someone in your family, someone in your neighborhood, a peer, a co-worker may be experiencing some type of dilemma that you might can help them make a good prognosis of. And we will end this show with with resources that I will provide you in this local community. And if you have any resources that we could add to the show, please don't hesitate to email or call in and we could uh, upgrade these resources on our show as we go. And we will end this show with a moment of catharsis. That's our, that's the host T Caseman emotional point of view. Well, I'm empathetic about a certain issue and give you some type of empowerment, motivational issue that could carry you through your life. So let's begin this journey today. All right. I would like to start off the quote of the day by a historian, George Washington Carver. This quote goes as this. How far you go in life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak or strong because someday in life, you will have been all of these. Now, you have to think about that for a moment. One day, one day, you might go through a financial difficulty. You might lose your job. You might encounter a disability through an accident. You might have emotional trauma due to an accident of a family member or a death of a family member. Your family might break up, might experience divorces. These are all different issues that affect our daily life. They affect our families and our friends. So George Washington Carver was very enlightful and very sympathetic to all of society's need when he made this quote. How far you go in life depends on you being tender with the young Compassionate with the age, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak or the strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. 
Let's Thank move you. on into our elephant in the room hour moment, rather. Let's talk about some issues that no one likes to talk about. There's not too much evidence to research on it, but here we go. Elephant in the room is mental health. What I mean when we say mental health, no one wants to talk about mental health. How many times have you been in a conversation with some, with someone at a bar, restaurant, or even with your colleagues or friends, and you talked about, maybe I suffered from depression last week. Maybe I lost my job and I just didn't feel any type of thrive to get out of bed today. Maybe I isolated myself away from all my friends and relatives, and I don't even know why. Maybe someone in my family always seemed a little eccentric, always wandered off or had bizarre behavior, and no one ever talked about it. Culturally, many individuals don't like to talk about mental health. It's like a taboo, but this show is talking about that elephant in the room, mental health. Now, mental health does not stand alone. Many people that has mental health issues suffer from core corn disorders. They utilize substance abuse to counteract the uh, negative effects of mental health. And unfortunately, many people can't control their substance use and it becomes a disorder. And you say, what's a disorder? Something that takes over your life that you can't control. And this is the Empowerment Hour. So we're going to talk about these issues so that we can empower you to do better, to control your life, help you seek professional help, that you may have a productive and long life as possible. Let's get to our social scenario. Imagine this. Your whole life, your entire life, you have heard a voice talking to you. That voice has comforted you in the moments of distress. That voice has told you, told you different avenues to take to help you through adverse situations. That voice comforted you in the middle of the night when you was alone. That voice encouraged you to take steps in your life that you never thought to take. And that voice or that friend accompanying you from childhood to adulthood. And the voice keeps getting louder. And maybe that voice told you some negative things one day. Maybe that voice told you that person over there don't like you. They keep staring at you. These are mental thoughts in your head. Maybe that voice that keeps talking to you tell you that uh, hurt yourself. Walk out in the middle of the street. No one cares about you. What if that voice told you that your self-worth is nothing? No one cares about you. And maybe after a while you get so used to that voice that you think that everybody else has this voice in their head. Everyone sees what you see. Maybe in your lifetime you see things and you see people that other people might not see. Maybe when you're riding the bus, you're having a total conversation with this voice or this friend that has been your companion, your best buddy, and no one else sees this friend. What if I told you that those are signs and symptoms of schizophrenia, a form of mental health? What if I came to you and said, T. Caseman, the person that been beside you your whole life, the person that tells you, encourage you, and give you all your directions doesn't exist. You mean to tell me that 
that person I grew up with or that person I encountered at a young age that helped me through all these trying times doesn't exist, how would you respond? This is our social scenario. This is what many people with schizophrenia face. Many people that check themselves into inpatient treatment have to hear these voices, have to hear the professional that, that are completing assessment, most of them psychiatrists or social workers, nurses, and they say these voices don't exist. These people do, do not exist. The voices are in your head. You have hallucinations and delusions. That's a very hard reality to accept. That no one's there when you're speaking to them. Now, schizophrenia, I'm reading out of the book, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual number four, the revised version. And this is the, pretty much the tool that any psychiatrist or mental health professional use to give diagnosis of people that checks themselves into a mental health hospital that suffer from some form of mental health treatment. And schizophrenia is diagnosed as 295.30 is a paranoid type form of schizophrenia. 295.10 is a disorganized type form of schizophrenia. And 295.20 is a catatonic type schizophrenia. Now these are all different intensities and severity of schizophrenia that people, the normal layman person probably never heard of this statistical manual or even heard of an assessment. But if you have schizophrenia and you got mental health treatment or you've been checked into a mental health um, facility, for treatment, you have heard these diagnoses. And you could follow this up with your healthcare practitioner. But for the purpose of this show, we just giving you an overview of what schizophrenia is so that you can help other people. You can recognize the signs and symptoms. You can kind of relate to people that suffer from schizophrenia or mental health. And you might be more sympathetic to help an individual instead of shun the individual. Now, 295.90 is undifferentiated type of schizophrenia, and I'm going to go through each one of these one by one so that you can be more enlightened about these diagnoses. And 295.60 is residual type of schizophrenia. Well, let's get to the types of schizophrenia. How about that? Let's get to what would be a symptom or indicator that I might have schizophrenia or I'm suffering from this type of disorder. If you have delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, catatonic-like behavior. Catatonic is when you have no motor movement or irregular movement, and you could tell the difference. Now, schizophrenia has positive and negative forms. But for the, for the purpose of this show, I just want to give you a brief overview and not be more clinical because I want to relate to the average individual, individual and give you insight on what to look for, how to affect me, and what resources to take about mental health. Now, schizophrenia, of course, is a defunction. It leads to social and occupational dysfunction. That's one of the issues. Interpersonal, academic achievement suffers because when you're going through a psychosis, as they call it, when your mind is racing and you hear all these thoughts and you can't relate to the average individual because you're trying to maintain control with inside your own internal world, and you might need medication to help you with this along with therapy. But this is not time for you to be social. Many people that suffer through these disorders are not sociable at the time. They isolate themselves as one of the indicators that we talked about before. Mental health affects us all. Even if you don't admit it, someone in your family or someone close to you might just be diagnosed with some sort of 
form of mental health. But for this show, we're just talking about schizophrenia. But whenever you check yourself into a mental health hospital, you have to understand that seeking treatment for those that are suffering from schizophrenia, seeking treatment. Whenever you're looking for a quality treatment, you need to look for flexibility in the services, the qualification of the therapist, and the type of therapy that that person is willing to use on you, use with you rather, psychoeducational or uh, psychotropic medications. These all things affect your body and your mind, and it helps your prognosis, help you sustain a balanced life. And that's the whole thing here. You want to get a balanced life. Everyone strives to have a balanced life. There is a, a nexus between positive service delivery and program retention. When it's sensitive, flexible, and it's person-centered. And I quoted this service delivery retention status from Paget, Hendon, and Abram and Davis in 2008. Engagement and retention and service among formerly homeless adults with core occurring mental health illness and substance abuse. For those of our academic friends that like to look that up, but let's talk about right now mental health facts. Some mental health facts that would um, enlighten you about what should I look for. And I'm going to read here St. Vincent Health. This article I pulled up off St. Vincent Health, and you can grab this article from, article from www.stvincent.org. And it has a lot of resources about mental health that you all might just want to read about and educate yourself in your private time about what to expect from mental health and, you know, what medications, how would I know I'm diagnosed with mental health, what are problematic areas I might need to look out for when I uh, experience these symptoms? Uh, is it regular to hear voices in my head? Uh, tell you, do does everyone hear voices? Uh, I had an old friend tell me, yeah, we all think out loud to ourselves, but um, do you answer yourself back? That that would be a good indicator that you might be having problems. But I don't know if that's a good indicator, you know, because mental health is so dynamic. It's like physical health. You know, physical health, when you're out of sync with your physical health, everything else suffers. One area in your life affects another. Health, wealth, wisdom. That's my motto. You have to take care of your health. And you have to work on your financial areas of your life so that stresses can kind of be minimized. And for as far as the wisdom part, you know, foolish ways does not benefit health or financially. A fool and money do not mix. So let's talk about what St. Vincent Health has to talk about mental health. I think we're doing pretty good on time here. Mental health facts. Good mental health is fundamentally good for overall health, to personal well-being, and the ability to lead a healthy, balanced, and productive life. Mental health problems can impair a person's thinking, feelings, and behaviors, and can be serious and disabling. According to U.S. Surgeon General report on mental health, nearly half of all Americans with a severe mental illness fail to seek treatment, and that is problematic for our society, for our family members, and for you as an individual. These are some statistics that St. Vincent quote about mental health. One in four people report they miss work as a result of work-related stress. Does that sound familiar? Workplace environment have a greater effect on employee stress level than the number of hours employees work. Workplace environment contributes to more stress than the number of hours you work. So maybe your supervisor pretty much give you a hard time 
maybe your coworkers giving you a hard time. You haven't even thought about the hours that you work, except for you want to clock out of work and leave that place quick as possible. But the next day you wake up, you have to endure that trauma again. So workplace environment plays a pivotal role in your mental health well-being. And you have to protect your mental health as well as your physical health. And when you have these issues, you need to seek therapy at your workplace or have a conventional meeting with your supervisors to try to relieve those stressors, relieve those problematic areas at work or wherever you do, volunteer work. But the key is to minimize your stress. Okay, let's continue. 75% of visits to the doctor offices concern stress-related ailments. 75%. Chronic stress can be double a person's risk of having a heart attack. And I worry about what I eat most of the time, but you have to maintain a balanced stress level. Stress is linked to six leading causes of death. Let's name them. Heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents, cryosis of the liver, and suicide. Horrible. Stress. In a typical workplace with 20 employees, four will likely develop a mental illness this year. Out of 20 employees, 20 employees, four. I'll tell you, that's, that's not a, that's alarming figures. That's alarming figures. More than three out of four employees who seek care for workplace issues or mental health problems see substantial improvement in work performance after treatment. So treatment plays a pivotal role in your outlook in life. Seeking help is not a taboo. Admitting that you have a problem or issues that you need to conquer and deal with is not a problem. It may be a problem for other people, but it shouldn't be a problem for you. You have to manage your stress. And you have to realize what state in life you are at right now. Untreated and mistreated mental illness cost the United States $100 billion in lost productivity each year. And each business in the United States, they foot up $44 billion for this bill. Now, we like to talk about the deficit and we like to talk about spending cap, spending limits. But we never talk about how much mental health affect the productivity of workers. We talk a lot about our jobs being shipped overseas, increasing import over export. But we never talk about the productivity of the individual working on these jobs in our cities. Because it is no accidental consequence that stress on the job relates to home stress. You can't go to work and suffer from your boss raising your stress level, your friends raising your stress level, lack of productivity on the job. Maybe you've been written up a couple of times and you don't come home and carry that negative feelings over to your loved ones, children, your mate, family members. So your mental health is vital in your productivity. Now, Anxiety-related disorder costs the United States at least $42 billion a year. And work-related and medical losses. Workers who abuse drugs cost their employers twice as much in medical and worker compensation claims as workers who do not abuse drugs. As many as 8 million Americans who have serious mental illness, do not receive adequate treatment 
each year. That's 8 million people walking in the United States with some form of mental health. It didn't say what type of severity. The study didn't, from St. Vincent didn't say what type of severity, the intensity, how often the episodes occur in the individual life. But you got to ask yourself, 8 million people walking around without treatment. What if there was an epidemic, epidemic broke out of the flu and 8 million people didn't take the flu shot or some type of treatment? How often, how, how often do you think that these people encounter you? When would you encounter that person? When we have the news today, let's take example the news. We have many shootings that are just horrible. Right now in Congress, they're talking about gun control and how to manage gun control and how mental health may have um, been incorporated in the person that carried out the crime behaviors. But we got 8 million people walking the earth well, here in the United States that do not receive treatment. And that may need to be the issue more than the gun control. Although about 16% of American adults will develop depression, at some point, only one-fifth will receive the care they need to treat the condition. There we go again. These are adults, and we haven't even talked about children. We haven't even talked about how the kids adapt in school. And we all know what peer pressure is in school. A lot of kids can't, uh, with faith, Facebook and their social networks, they can't really manage having, having negative um, things said about them because many kids don't express themselves. They may have mental health. We just talked about how schizophrenia makes you isolated, hear voices, delusions, hallucinations, so we have to take this in consideration. Mental health plays a part in each one of our lives, just like employment, just like your physical health plays a vital role. An estimated 2.5 million Americans have bipolar disorder. And according to St. Vincent standard, this is an estimate. Because the number could at least be two or three times higher. Because 80% of people with the illness go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Now, much of our treatment surrounds the diagnostic statistical matter number four. But there's a lot of practitioners that have different levels of skills. And misdiagnosis is a common thing. You can even go to the doctor for a physical problem and, and they can misdiagnose you for, you know, some form of health related issue. So error accounts for anything that you do, even in your work. You're not perfect in your daily life, uh, daily work life. Everyone makes mistakes. That's just part of uh, human nature, as I say. Regular physical exercise can help people reduce stress, depression, and anxiety and can enable them to better cope with adversity. Now, I see a lot of gyms and churches popping up on almost every corner. And it's not a bad thing because it employs people, but it also gives people an opportunity to exercise. And most of the Information out there today say that 30 minutes a day helps you release stress and benefits your health. So you don't have to run a triathlon to try to reduce your stress. You take your nice casual stroll, put on a headphone set, relax, and enjoy yourself. Now, anytime we can have callers call in and, at our 813-235-0644 and comment on any of these facts that St. Vincent has put out on their website. And we can talk about how these facts affect your life, affect your family life. And you can remain anonymous. You don't have to say your name or anything. You can say what city you call from because these are hot issues. The elephant in the room is mental health. And I do understand and sympathize that many people do not want to share 
that they suffer from mental health because not too many times when you go out on a date and meet people, and you talk about your mental health issues. I don't think so. I think that's a taboo. I think you'd probably be scared that you're going to run the person off, but um, or or you won't make a good connection. But these are issues that need to be talked about. They need to be followed through on. They need treatment. They need to be addressed daily. And they need to be reevaluated over time, you know, because everyone needs a timeline in their life. You, you have to judge progress and evaluate how far you are today compared to how far you'll be in the future. And you determine that timeline now. And it's pretty simple to do these things. But, and we'll talk about that a little later in the show. We'll talk about strategies to use when, um, you know, you want to you wanna help yourself through mental health or physical health or anything like that. Or even when you go to the doctor, what should I ask the doctor? Or how could I... Uh, minimize people stereotyping me when I do suffer from hallucinations and I'm out in public. You know, these are things to talk about. And we'll just generally talk about these conversations. I think we have a call in. Let's see who's calling in. Hello? Hello? We're having a few technical issues, so work with us. Hello, caller. Are you there? Yes, I am. Well, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, would you like to give your name or would you like to stay anonymous today? No, I'll give my name. My name is Aretha, and I'm calling from Orlando, Florida. Well, wonderful. How is the weather in Orlando? Uh, it's pretty okay. It's a nice evening. I can't complain. Well, what's on your mind today, Aretha? Um, I have a question. Um, first of all, I think it's important... Um, for my question, that I let you know that I'm African American. Okay. And as an African American, we tend not to deal with mental health issues. We always say that that's an uncle or cousin or a you know a friend that has this issue, and we'll just kind of let it go. But um, I'm having an issue with one of my family members. It's actually my brother. He's about 19 years of age. Lately, he started to become very irritable. Okay. He cannot sleep. He's having difficulty concentrating on things. His mind is racing all the time. He sometimes, he just cannot focus on one task. He could just be doing something as simple as washing the dishes, and then he'll just stop what he's doing, and then he'll go make a sandwich, and then he'll stop what he's doing, and he'll do something else, and it's just like watching him just run around the room all the day. And, um... He's very difficult to be around. He has a poor appetite. And I'm thinking he's starting to display some symptoms of some sort of mental health. And um, I don't know what to do or where to take him to get some sort of assistance. I see. Um, well, how long this this uh, symptoms been going on that you notice or he report that these symptoms been going on? For at least uh, a year now maybe even a little bit longer, but it's been manageable, if you will, but now it's starting to become not manageable. I see. And what are the signs that is not manageable? What uh, is it interrupting his so, you know, social or employment or educational achievement? Yes, because he's not able to sleep. His friends that he would go out and usually do stuff, play basketball, or go to the mall and hang out, you know, like the young adults do. He doesn't want to do that, and he's isolating himself. And is do you think that you have a family history of mental health, or, you know? I actually do, because this is some of the um, issues that my dad had displayed, and also, like, my grandfather as well. I see. So it is a family history of depression or uh, some type of mental health. And I heard you say before that uh, maybe you think that your family member have a depression because that sounds like something that um, uh, you heard before or you read up on this 
the definition before. Which one is it? Yeah. Um, I heard it before, and I've also, someone also said, well, maybe he's depressed. We had a death of the matriarch of our family. Mm-hmm. And everyone, the whole family is in disarray when, you know, grandma died. And so some people were able to deal with it and exercise and kind of go on with their normal routine. But he was the one that was most with grandma. And so he's just not been able to cope with her loss. I see. It's very difficult to talk about this, especially culturally. You know, African-Americans are hard to talk about depression. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult yeah. to... Um, in our inner circles to admit that uh, maybe we have issues to deal with because most of the time we seek our treatment through church or religious affiliations. Is that something you agree with or you disagree? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, have your brother ever thought about seeking out treatment or you thought about encouraging him to go to treatment? Yeah, I, um, I wanted to encourage him to go and probably seek out some treatment because now he's gotten to the point where I'm watching his personal hygiene change. He doesn't want to shave. Um, he, like I said, he's poor appetite. He's having difficulty sleeping. He's very, very irritable, which he was very outgoing and friendly initially. And so um, yeah. I want to ask him to go, and I want to be able to present options to him. So that, you know, I won't say, oh, you're just depressed or whatever I think it is. I want to be able to be a support system to him as well. That's wonderful. I commend you on your support for your family member and addressing this issue. One area, uh, one one thing you could do is call your local area. And most local areas have a 211. And okay. it's an information line, and they have a comprehensive list of any mental health facility or therapist that could deal and diagnose your brother' behaviors. They can even do individual treatment or group treatment, you know, where most of the family can come into treatment to help benefit because your brother not only lives for himself, he lives with part of the part of your family, you know. And uh, everyone needs to be more educated and informed about how to help him and you know depression it sounds like you know most of the issues that people deal with are depression those are indicators that you mentioned about irritability or uh, isolating themselves the poor appetite insomnia low energy fatigue low self-esteem poor concentration and 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 one of the worst signs or indicators that you might need to look out for your brother is the feeling of hopelessness most of the time people get to that feeling of hopelessness and and they isolate themselves it's a very it's a red flag for a person thinking about hurting themselves so it's not good for individuals to uh isolate themselves but uh, this is not a formal diagnosis by no mean and i refer you to any um you know mental health professional right. with proper credentials but it is an area you do have indicators your brother are giving you signs and indicators that he may be in that area of a mood disorder so okay. if if anything, you could call 211 in your local area. You just pick up the phone and dial 211, and someone will pick up, and you can remain anonymous. And you could see, I, I recommend that people get at least three recommendations that could help them out. And uh, there's always a mental health treatment center in your local area, and you can locate those in the um, phone book. One of the biggest area, biggest mental health facilities in this area in Tampa is Suncoast. Or we have Tampa Mental Health Center. See, every area has someone to address uh, mental health. And even your health department could guide you, your local health department could guide you to um, what places to go. You know, And uh, you can go on WebMD, and they have a comprehensive, comprehensive list of doctors, treatment, and symptoms, and even areas of concern when a person you know, have questions. They have a, a blog site for family members. How do I know if my family member is suffering from mental health? How do I know what to do and uh, if it's going to affect me? Because you might have a question that um, since my brother is suffering from this, and maybe it's a gene thing. Maybe it's hereditary, which is, you know, not so. But uh, these are thoughts that people have, you know. Is it contagious? Because mental health is not well known or well or not well talked about, you know. 
How do you feel about that information that I gave you? You think that's very insightful for you? Yes, because I was at a total loss, and like I said, everyone said, oh, he'll get over it or whatever, because as, like I said before, we had lost our grandmother, and she was the matriarch of the family. So everyone was dealing with their own type of depression, mm-hmm. but it seems like everybody else was able to, you know, move on and go, you know, get kind of get their life back in order. The loss is still there. The hurt is still there, and sometimes you still cry or you're still sad, but he just started developing these symptoms, and then it just overtook his life. And then that's why I am so concerned about him. Well, you, you are guiding it in the right way. And St. Vincent, off some of the facts that I reported earlier, the yes. treatment success rate for uh, disorders of depression is 80% once you seek treatment. So that's Wonderful. very encouraging for someone like yourself. And. I have a little strategy because on this show with T. Caseman, we like to talk about, you know, an issue that you have, how to seek treatment, and add you with some resources that could help you. And since we talked about how to get in contact with, uh, you know, mental health services to help you or your family members, let me give you an example of Social Work 101 that says uh, how do you assess yourself and how do you look for uh, other other people in your family to see what plagues your family, what is a problematic situation. And most social workers use a tool called uh, EcoMap. And an EcoMap, you can draw all your family members, you draw a circle around a circle, okay? Okay. And each circle represents a family member. So you put yourself in the center of center circle, and you draw a circle outside of that circle. And you put a family member, each one of your family members, your brother, your aunt, your mother, or anyone else is living that are close to you and even not living. And you put uh, MH for mental health in each one of those boxes that circle that represent a family member. And that'll let you know how pervasive it runs through the family. And if you need to maybe get an evaluation, maybe you need to check some of the things in areas in your life have you found yourself isolating yourself uh, have you found yourself losing interest in things you used to love have you found yourself losing appetite after appetite you know have you found yourself isolating yourself or not willing to talk to people so these you know sometimes we work and we go through life and we experience these things but we never really think that it might be an issue or dysfunction until we start losing our work, like you mentioned your brother, he, it started affecting his work and his social life. Now you realize it's a problem, but it's like the, the pot on the stove. We don't always want to wait till the pot is boiling over and about to explode before we solve any problems. So this eco map could help you uh, identify all areas of your life. It could be physical. It could be health. It can even be resources. You could be you could have lack of resources in your area and you can use an eco map to identify and evaluate your own, your own, your own mental health, your own health care, your own finances. And I hope that was able to help you out. Yes, I have one last question, if you don't mind. Okay. I wanted to know if mental health illness, is that hereditary? Well, most most individual most professionals, especially like in the WebMD, they would say like there's a gene, but I haven't seen a schizophrenia gene, and I'm not a physician. But okay. last time I checked, I don't think it's too much out there. Say okay, that's a gene like Down syndrome. You can identify a chromosome right. that actually uh, develop and and uh, to a prognosis of your functional ability later in life. Schizophrenia onset usually occur in young adulthood, and it's many kids that do get diagnosed with it. But, of course, like uh, St. Vincent said, many of our people are misdiagnosed because mental health has still been explored on several areas. So, right. you know, uh, I think more education in that area, and you can ask the therapist and what resources I would go online and research some of these journal articles to read about, to see what contributes to mental health, what contributes to depression. And St. Vincent uh, reports that stress is a major contribution contributor to stress, um, to depression, or any type of mental health. 
So I don't think it's a gene that says, okay, you're going to be born with mental health issues. If I'm wrong, then some of you professionals and doctors or uh, could call in and clarify because we're open here. This show is always room for improvement. But I don't. I, I wouldn't worry so more much about hereditary than finding out if it's an issue involved in your life. And assessment is a major part of finding that out. Like I gave you a personal assessment you could do at the house to realize how pervasive um, through the eco map mental health carries through your family. But assessment. Um, really, in this article of nursing and residential care, assessment is a, is, is a need assessment. It's a vital part of social work. Okay. It plays a fundamental role in determining what type of service you need. Now, most people think if I get an assessment, I got to get treatment. That's not so. An assessment can stand alone. It can stand alone. You might just want to get the assessment and meditate on what you would like to do about that information you know or how to seek treatment you know and most of these assessments are open-ended questions like i ask you how do you feel you know how do you feel about the day how do you feel when you identify depression you know that's an open-ended question a closing the question is like a yes or no answer you know and usually these come in the form of uh uh, instrument that someone would give you. You would use the Beck Depression Scale. That might be something you might want to look up. Find out, okay. take a self-assessment test, yes or no answers, and get it scored. You know, okay. uh, Most of these are not free services, so if you could find an evaluation online and help you out, um, that would be good, or, or some type of uh, uh, instrument to see if you have indicators or problematic areas with depression or mental health. Uh, it's a lot of resources online like WebMD. Um, I think they offer a, a small assessment to see if you need to seek some type of help or maybe start thinking about being concerned. So these are things, you know, that hopefully can help you in your life. And again, I reiterate that the health department is a vital role in your area. 211 is a vital role to call. And... You always have a mental health center in your neighborhood, and you can look that up in the phone book. And you don't have to be Baker Act, Marchman Act. You don't have to have a mental health breakdown to seek treatment. And I know that in this area, you know, we have, like, children hospitals. We have the Catholic charities. They help out with a lot of mental health counseling. And there are even private pay individuals for adult services that you might yeah. want to seek out, you know. And, um, yeah. Family Resource Centers. It's always good to look for that. Family okay. Resource Centers. I have one final question before I monopolize the time because I'm sure there might be a couple other callers calling in. Okay. The final question is, um, I only have state plan Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Are mental health services and treatment covered by the state plan Medicaid? Well, the state plan Medicaid is always dynamic. It's always changing because of the state's funding. But okay. uh, many of our individuals can seek treatment at the local mental health center and if you have Medicaid they will bill your Medicaid so there's no out-of-pocket cost if you're on Medicaid then and you can also at these mental health centers get psychotropic medications if it's deemed uh, you need any type of medication to help you and you can get those medication filled right there at their pharmacies or you could take it to like CVS or another pharmacist that you have in mind but every Medicaid recipient has the HMO or some form of uh, insurance that uh, covers uh, prescription drug medications and 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 uh, you can go to Medicaid website and find out what types of uh, uh, Prescription medications is covered under what type of Medicaid HMO, and you can also find out when to switch enrollment times. Usually, it's around October to December, you know, a date. And I need to look that up myself because I'm just speaking from reference. But uh, it's it's always good to go to that Medicaid website, and it's um, you can find out more information. But uh, yes, you can seek treatment if you get Medicaid and you don't have a out of pocket fee or you could pay pay privately. Thank you very much, T Casey, and have a wonderful evening. This has been a great experience and I am going to um 
take your advice and I'm going to go get some assistance for my brother. And I'd like to call you back and give you a report and let you know how things are going. Well, T. Caseman will be here. And thank you for calling Miss Aretha from Orlando, Orlando, Florida, with your questions. And we're always open for discussion. We're here to talk to you and not at you and give you empowerment perspective to the, your context and daily unique issues in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. We was talking about uh, schizophrenia, mental health. In this show today, we even had a caller that called in that really sounded as though they benefited from some of the information that we have. And in the last few minutes of this show we got seven minutes before the show in before i get to my uh catharsis moment our caller referred us to some resources made me think about some resources in your community that can help you and i like to reiterate some of those resources take a couple of minutes to review some resources in this area and you have to research in your area to be more specific but um even if you're homeless there's homeless shelters. Remember, there's always a place for you. And there's transitional living. There's a uh, touch by angel ministries, shepherd village. Maybe you need to investigate those in your area. Those are chip emergency shelters. If you have to evacuate your home or you might be a male or female escaping a, a domestic violence situation, these places are always willing to take you in. And not all of these places has a fee. So one way to call and find out is to call your local 211 and find out what transitional housing is out there, what homeless shelter, even food banks. Food banks is an excellent source of supplementing your mm, housing income because these are difficult times. Many people are not, uh, not employed. And here's the list of places that kids can eat for free. You know, you got Applebee's. Nobody really knows that you could take your kids and eat their Applebee's free if they still have a special. And look, just call up your Applebee's and just ask them, what's the age limit of my kid eating, eating for free to kind of minimize the cost of going out to dinner? Because we all need to get out and share in a family event. And sometimes that's around dinner. Dinner is an excellent place in my household where we sit around and talk about all types of social issues. Uh, beef O'Brady. Call Beef O'Brady and see if they have a special for you uh, that you can eat. Uh, your kids can eat for free to save with money. Buffalo Wild Wings. Um, Chick-fil-A have specials. There's a lot of resources out there for people that they don't know about. And this show is geared toward helping people realize there's a lot more in your community that maybe you haven't utilized. Cody Road House Restaurant. Denny's. Italian restaurants, Denny's, uh, Gyro King Sub, IHOP is a major one that kids eat at a discounted, uh, no, no fee. Perkins, Piccadilly, Untouchable Pasta and Pizza, Steak and Shake. Steak and Shake is an excellent place. I love Steak and Shake. Um, food pantries, okay? Always call in your local health department to see if any food pantries out there for you. You know, and most of them are surrounded around religious affiliations like churches, like Christian, Christian uh, charities. Um, and you can get the address of these people. Helping Hands. These are kind of name tags that uh, help people. Day Star, Feast, you know, it's an acronym. Uh, Green Chapel, AME Church, St. Giles Emergency Food Pantry. Salvation Army is an excellent place. Sow a Seed. These are all excellent places to seek, um, you know. Um, food pantry help transitional housing is one Suncoast Mental Health Center since we talked about mental health it's excellent even if you need baby seats you know you might have a newborn baby you have a baby seat you know you need to call your local fire department they always have information on giveaway of baby seats you know neighborhood family center locate that in your area could they have locate that in your area you have excellent resources even the police department Call the police department. They have a lot of information. Even if you need a cell phone, there's assurance wireless cell phone. It's free for those on Medicaid, like our caller called in earlier. And they give you like 200 and free minutes. All you have to do is apply safe line wireless service for if you want a home phone. See, these are all discounted services, you know. GED programs. There's always in your community. Children medical services, you know, for your kid diagnosis, diagnostic learning resource centers. 
and help with your health related. The family health centers in your area help you with a low cost uh, of not going to the emergency room. Maybe you pay 20% of the total bill. You can even get labs, you know. We have an area over here called Temple Health Center, the Driver License Center, Social Security, and Birth Certificate. These are all the places that the health department, departments in the health department that you need to get familiar with. These are resources to help you. Now, in our last couple minutes of the show is our moment of catharsis, all right? We have like three minutes left, and this is my time to talk to you and not at you about life. It's my emotional contribution to my audience. And... What I, my thing in life is to seek balance. It's very important to seek balance. You got to realize where you at to know where you want to go in life. You got to understand your distance. You got to understand your value in life. You got to understand your needs, your contributions, and your deficits. And if it takes sitting down to write all these different things out to realize where you at, what type of mate you need, what type of education you need to further your life, what type of um, job you would like, you have to start right here today. All right? Because you got to remember now, if you live two days farther than now, you you still going to get one day or five years older. You got to ask yourself, um, how do you want to see yourself five years from now? Set you some short-term goals, some long-term goals because if you do not leave this world which i hope not there's a day that you're going to wake up i mean you're going to ask yourself have i achieved all the personal goals that i have set and those there's no better thing than to wake up and say i'm happy with myself this affects your mental health it affects the people around you it affects your neighborhood and your community and my thing in life is, my mantra in life is, allow yourself to be great. And to do that, you got to take on the great challenge of managing individual adversities in your life, conquering them, face them. You have to face the demon inside. Those areas in life that are difficult for you, sit down and write it out how you need to address it. Either it need to be addressed professionally or you seeking some sort of support group or spiritual group and you can use all these in combination but there must be a time you need to sit down and face your fears or your taboo areas in your life to allow yourself to be great because my whole goal is that you should wake up one day in the near future and that you have a smile and happy to be here on this earth and appreciate the value of life and the people in your life. There's no greater thing to love yourself and then you're able to love others. So if you haven't got anything from this show, allow yourself to be great. Do great things. And most of all, do something about the issues at hand in your daily life. This is the empowerment show where we talk to you and not at you. And we add an empowerment perspective to daily life events and context to unique things in your life. And have a great day. I'm your host, Tease Caseman, and I look forward to talking to you next Wednesday at 730. Thank you. <laughs>